Betty Jane Spencer. Um, in terms of other reference material, a book called What Murder Leaves Behind is uh, it includes Betty Jane's story. And at the moment, we can't think of the author, but I will get it to you when you're ready to do this. There's also a video called Shattered Dreams that I have several copies of and that I will be happy to donate one to this project. But um, I think it might be useful, Betty Jane, in spite of the resources that are out there, for you to share with us a bit about the facts um, of what happened to you, just so people down through the years don't get it mixed up. <coughs> In 1977, on Valentine's Day, four young men entered my rural home in Indiana, uh, carrying shotguns. They had my four son and, four, and three stepsons, and I lie on the floor, and after taking a few things from our house, they shot us all with their shotguns. I survived the the boys all were all died immediately. It's been a, a rather hard time, but I, I really wanted to to do something that would make their their life their death not in vain. So I I tried to to do things to help others, and that's basically where my Victim Services came in. Betty Jane, tell us what the field of crime victim rights and services was like uh, back in 1977. Uh, in 1977, there actually were very few victim advocates. <coughs> Uh, I didn't know of any. I had a detective that helped me actually did the job of a victim advocate, although we didn't know what to call him. Uh, but the field was very small. And it, at that time, uh, it was mostly, um, it, it was mostly a, uh, Oh, uh, domestic abuse and things of that sort. Not the whole gamut of, of, uh, <coughs> of victims as it is today. And most victim advocates were working as volunteers, using their own homes and their own money. And I think the first NOVA conference I went to there was 150 people there. That's a very small amount compared with what goes today. I know that you were uh, real involved with NOVA from the beginning. And am I remembering right that NOVA was started in 1978? you remember? No, 76. 76. So it had just really been pulled together when you... Can you tell us a little bit about those early days of NOVA and your involvement with them? <coughs> we spent a lot of sleepless nights training each other. They trained me and I talked about how victims feel. And uh, I would always stay with John and Marlene, uh, John Stein and Marlene Young, and we would just sit and talk. And they did I got a lot of training from them. I was invited to speak at NOVA conferences, which then I invited to stay at the conference. And uh, my lack of finances made it really nice because then I got a lot of training that I would not have been able to afford. And uh, I really <coughs> got to know people. And I, we would sit around the coffee shop and, and share stories and, and teach each other. We, we really didn't have the, the people to train us at that time. It was, uh, it was very well, kind of 
you were on your own. <laughs> but just they were very devoted people. And uh, and we learned from each other. Part question and it has to do with the challenges that you face and I I'm saying that I think it's two part because um, I think it's, it would be of interest personally after such a devastating crime for people to hear what do you think were your greatest personal challenges to, uh, to uh, work towards getting through and then the second part is uh, I'd like you to talk a little bit about when you started Protect the Innocent and what some of the challenges were in starting a little grassroots movement, movement here in Indiana totally from the ground up. And those are, those are separate, I think, but maybe they're the same. Now I've already forgotten the first question. Okay, the, <laughs> the first question was personally. Yeah. Looking back on it, what do you think were the greatest challenges you had to overcome in getting to this place where you wanted to make something good out of it, you wanted to make the rest of your life as other-centered as possible. What what did you have to get through to get to that place? The main thing I had to get through was my anger. I was extremely angry. I was angry with everybody. I was very angry at God because I had been taught that she lived a good life to you. God took care of you and protected you and answered your prayers. Well, he answered my prayers, but not the way I wanted to answer. And uh, so I had to get past that anger, which took a long time and lots of counseling. And then I, I decided that I could do something. I wasn't sure what. Make to change the laws in Indiana. For, and help victims. And I was told by a legislator or a censor that um, I should lobby for different laws. I didn't even have the, any idea what you did when you lobbied. <coughs> I, uh, I just uh, said a lot of prayers after I got over being mad with God and, and uh, I said, if you open the doors, I walked through, and uh, I didn't know he was going to open so many doors, but I walked through a lot of them. But we, we were able. We, we formed a group called Protect the Innocent, <coughs> and um, we lobbied for stronger vic uh, victim laws and stronger criminal laws, and uh, we were very successful. Uh, Unbelievably successful. We um, we knew nothing about lobbying, but we had someone who did that helped us. That was Scott Stovall. He was an attorney that had lobbied in Washington D.C. that came back to Morrisville, Indiana, and he worked with us and trained us. And we <coughs> I hadn't even thought about. We traded out his services. He was just opening his law office, so he took time off from his law office to help us, the legislator, and we took time off and worked as his secretaries. <laughs> and two of us girls <clears throat> worked in his office on those days, and then I still had a business to run, but it all worked out. But we were very successful and didn't know how successful we were at first. Uh, we, uh, the first year we lobbied for four bills and we got four bills passed. And uh, so I really thought this was just an easy thing and I discovered that sometimes it takes years to get just one simple bill through. But all in all, uh, a group of us, not just protect the innocent, but Working with other groups, we got 56 laws changed in Indiana in six years and uh, really didn't realize what an accomplishment that was until later. <coughs> and then we formed Protect the Innocent Victims Foundation, which aids victims. And uh, we have 
it is still in existence and uh, it's on the local plan and it's local grant and uh, and people actually get paid and we have offices now and in Indiana you're required to have a victim assistant in every county some of them don't do a whole lot because they just don't understand what they can do and what they should be doing. But for the most part, it's a big step forward. <clears throat> you don't, we no longer have the victim's family sitting on one side of the hall in the courthouse and the, the perpetrator's family sitting looking at them and all those discomforts that we used to have. Uh, those things are, have changed drastically. They may sound like small things, but they were big things to a victim. I can remember walking past David Smith's mother and the dirty look she would give me. He was one of the killers and she was acting as though I was hurting her child and there he had helped kill my child. And it was a very uncomfortable thing that I had to walk past her. of any um, kind of unique or unusual or creative stories about either when you were lobbying to get your bills passed or uh, once you started providing victim services? Any, um, any stories about something kind of out of the box that you were able to do to help a victim? Well, when it comes back to lobbying, I had no idea how to lobby. Uh, the only thing was people in the legislature, most of the Senate and the House, knew my story, knew who I was. That was helpful because they were respectful and they did listen to what I had to say. We had a, a, a pin uh, that we wore. It was the scales of justice balanced. And it was, the scales were made in PTI, Protect the Innocent. And it was rather unique. And I didn't, at that time I was rather shy. And I didn't know how to approach these legislators. So I started riding the elevator. And the, the house offices were in a place it was hard to find. And I really had to keep on top of who I had talked to. That was my biggest challenge. And invariably they would say, well, what does that pin stand for? And I would tell them about it. And I'd say, do you know where I think it was 238 is? And they'd say, oh, yes, I'm going there. Of course, I had that in mind that they were probably going there. And uh, you, I'll show you. Well, of course, it was quite out of the way, and so on the way, I was lobbying him all the time. <laughs> I had a lot of unique experiences with uh, working with victims. Uh, there's a small community. You know a lot of them. And, you've, of course, it's best if you don't get too involved in their lives, but it's very difficult not to. And I still have relationships with some of the victims I worked with. And uh, now they're helping me now that I'm sick. <coughs> but one of the most heartbreaking situations was a little boy that was molested by a stranger in his little town. And uh, he he just he didn't fit with all these little girls that had been molested, and he really had a hard time adjusting to the fact that he was the only boy in the uh, we had support groups for the children, and uh, many of the people in his little town just blamed him rather than the. 20-year-old that molested him. And the 20-year-old forced him to have oral sex so 
even his own brothers and sisters wouldn't kiss him. And he really had quite a time. And his parents were, uh, well, they, I kept saying, we've got to get professional counseling for this child. And they kept telling me he wasn't crazy. And I kept telling him, oh, he's not crazy. He needs professional counseling. Because he was becoming extremely angry and destructive. Uh, he broke the car window, oh, windshield out, and things of that sort. And finally, I talked to his father and convinced him to get professional counseling. And I just asked the nurse here the other day if she knew this little boy. And she said, yes, and he's doing fine. And I felt so good about it. <coughs> but I worked with a lot of molested children. At that time, when I was working with victims, there wasn't a number of domestic violence that was showing up. Now there are. But at that time, they, they weren't. They were keeping it to themselves. Now we, in Park County, we have a lot of domestic violence. And uh, they're doing something about it. Um, before, they're just, uh, they just weren't coming out. But the, the children, after, it seems as though when the children got to a certain age, then they told. They got brave enough to tell. And uh, we had uh, good people to work with. The sheriff's department was good to work with me. The, the, at that time, it was the welfare department. They, they worked with me, and uh, I really had, it all worked together quite nicely. And I'm just proud that it's still going on, and still, still working. Um, can you tell us about any failures that you think you experienced along the way that might be useful to new people in the field? <coughs> well, there's always failures. But one of the things is where I had to learn was just because you're lobbying a bill and it doesn't go through this year, that doesn't mean it you bring it back next year and the next and sometimes the next it won't go through an example of that was <coughs> when I wanted to have open court where people would be, be able to come to um, and not to pro hearings and pregnancy hearings I wanted people notified that these things were coming up. And this is one of my funny jokes that goes along with it. In Indiana at that time, if you wanted to get a bill through, you went to legislative services and told them what you wanted, had them write the bill, then you took the bill and found the sponsor for it. So I told them what I wanted. I wanted the people notified and be able to attend parole hearings. And he looked at me so shocked and he says, but that's against the law. <laughs> I said, yes, I know, that's why I'm here. <laughs> but um, the main thing is don't give up. If it's important, go after it and stay with it. And learn to, to give a little bit. No. Learn to ask for a little more than you'll settle for. Uh, we wanted uh, clemency hearings to uh, only be available to people with multiple uh, convictions every five years. What we would have settled for was three. And we, were, we got nowhere. And I got a letter about three years ago that <coughs> didn't see her hearings for uh, multiple convictions are every five years now. <laughs> yes, yeah, finally got, got it through, and it, uh, and it was what we wanted. And then actually, we were asking for five with our hopes that we would get three. So. 
sometimes you have to put it up a little bit so that you can compromise. Um, let's take a little personal side trip here because I know planning to speak at those clemency hearings every time you've had to over the last decade has been very stressful. Um, I wonder if you could talk about that just a little bit and uh, how you anticipate that that's going to happen after you're gone. Well, I know it's going to happen after I'm gone because a new group of people are asking to be notified now. We only ask that the next of kin be notified and they through to the point that anybody that wants to be notified just lets the <clears throat> victim advocate and corrections know and they will be notified by registered voter. And people are coming to me now and asking me, okay, how can I get help? Preparing for it the first year was terrible. I didn't know what to expect, and it was uh, ten years after the death of the boys. <coughs> they were, of course, they don't appear at that hearing, but their families did. And they were talking about what nice people they were, and, and I got up and left because that was not... I, I was having a hard time with that. So a man came out and told me how wrong I was to feel the way I felt. And it was just a hard time all around. But I was always treated so nicely by the parole board. I mean, no favors, they just listened. They, they, they cared. And I'm sure they did with every victim came before them. And uh, <coughs> uh, it, the last time that we came up before the board was almost 10 years ago. We had so much media there, I think they gave up. I think they're just waiting for me to die, so I've got to work hard to stay alive. But, because I'm sure they will really come out of the woodwork when I die. But they're going, they're going to be surprised if the number of people are going to be there. But, the last hearing, there was three of the four investigators on the case that came to testify. I'd never heard of that one before. And there was a man sitting beside me that was over testifying, or sitting on the front row. And he was sitting beside me, and he had a whole stack of papers and briefs and things. And I thought, was well, he a minister that's going to again tell us how bad we are for <coughs> wanting, not wanting to let them out? This was a man that wrote the brief against this. This was David Smith's hearing. And this is a man that wrote the brief for the appeals court against David Smith. But that I've never heard of either that someone like that come and testify. And I, they'll never know how much I appreciate that, because, I mean, that's, that's heavy stuff. That's just not an emotional mother. That's people that know what happened and, and care about what happens to people. So, as someone said, we had everybody there that day, but the good year blank. <coughs> I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. We're just glad to be able to get this. Um, you have had many, many, many accomplishments over the years. Um, can you identify what you think may be your greatest accomplishment or maybe your top two? That could be anything from work with a particular victim all the way to a particular bill that got passed. As a matter of fact, I think I'm going to turn this off a minute and let you think about it, because I can tell. Well, people who work with victims try not to get too involved in their lives, but sometimes it's just not possible. 
and the first uh, juvenile victim I had was a 14-year-old girl that was <coughs> an attempted rape victim. And it was not just somebody grabbed her and she got away. It was a very brutal attempted rape. And she really had such a hard time. And he threatened her that if she told anybody, she, she would he would hurt her family. And of course, these victims believe this. These youngsters are terribly frightened of what these people do. Do this to me, what would they do to my mother? And, you know. Um, she became actually too dependent on me. And uh, I, uh, I had to straighten that out because I knew that, <coughs> that that was not good for her. So one night when she was upset, I said, well, I'm, I guess I'm going to have to get someone else to work with you. And she said, why? And I said, because I haven't done my job. And her question again was why. And I said, it's my job to teach you how to take care of yourself and how to survive through this. And I haven't done that. I thought you did depend on me, so it's not working. Oh, oh, I, I, I'll be good. <laughs> And uh, then we began to work together better because she was less dependent on me. But that was in 1983 or 84, and she's still my gal as far as I'm concerned. She lived very close. She's married and has four children, and uh, I'm not in the nursing home. She comes to see me often. And it, it's a relationship that's growing. And, I think we both become better people because of each other. She's, uh, she calls me her second mom, and I think of her as my kid. She's very special to me. As far as legislation, one of the greatest things that I had an opportunity to work on was the VOCA funds. Well, it was a 1984 Victims of Crime Act, yes, that was the first one. But what it did, what the local funds were, the funds that were derived from uh, a percentage of federal fines and then used for victim services. So it was not taxpayers' money. And you were able to get these funds through grants you had to perform certain things, and and I was fortunate enough to be on the committees that made the rules. I there have been times when I had my bulk of grand, and I said, "Ooh, I I hate to do all these things, but <laughs> I had to do them, and I couldn't even go out because I'd been part of making the rules." But it, it was an important thing, where there was funding for people before there was people just spending great amounts of their own money to help other people. And um, I was fortunate enough to have a husband that thought this was important too. Therefore, he didn't complain when I used money that could have easily been used for something else or victim services. But it, through all of this, I had the opportunity to speak before the president's Victim of Crime Committee, right? <laughs> no, sorry, yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 uh, anyway, <coughs> through that, I met several people that were active in the victims movement on the federal level. And I was able to work with them, and I had the opportunity to be with President Reagan three times. And he was a very, very concerned president about victims. And uh, had a lot of 
sympathy for us. And he said to me, he said, you were a crime victim and so was I, but I was president. People took care of me, but then people really take care of you. Well, I was fortunate from a small town. I didn't have it as badly as most crime victims have. But it's still, you, you become a piece of evidence very quickly, more than a crime victim. And it's a, it's a tough thing. And, and like I said, I was probably treated better than, than a lot of them. But I'm very proud when we still have our Protect the Innocent Foundation and active here in, in Park County. And uh, yeah, I'm very proud that after all these years, it's still going, still helping victims. And not only does it help victims, but it helps get convictions because when you, your victim if helped, then they're much more willing to testify and do the things that they really need to do. And when there's somebody standing beside them, it works so much better. I'm just getting a little away. No, you're, you're doing great. Um, not only have you worked with Protect the Innocent with all kinds of victims here in, in Indiana, but you spent some years working for Mothers Against Drunk Driving as well. Can you talk about name recognition and how um, how the names of groups, once they are respected, either at the state level or the national level, uh, helps in terms of lobbying? It does help in, to have a name recognition. Uh, of course, Mothers Against Drunk Driving was uh, an organization that got a lot of attention right away with Candy Leitner knew how to work to get the attention that, that Mothers Against Drunk Driving needed. Um, before that time, there was so little attention. These people killed by drunk drivers and, and injured by drunk drivers. And Although a person doesn't get in the car with the intention of going out and killing somebody, it still is such an avoidable crime. And uh, Protect the Innocent became known mainly because the ACLU <laughs> didn't like us very well. <laughs> so they helped us become known by always fighting us, and that was all right. Because uh, sometimes you your enemies can, be, can help you more than your friends. But they, of course, opposed different laws. For instance, uh, uh, innocent, okay. What was that big law? Oh, <laughs> the question? No, uh, uh, the big, big law that we got through the first year. Oh, yeah, we were mentally ill. No. And that was a very good uh, law. What it did, it provided that people could be found guilty and serve a, a, a sentence in a mental institution. But then, when they were pronounced cured, finished their sentence in prison. So it wasn't as an ad advantageous to plead guilty. Um, because of insanity, because it just didn't work as good. And that was particularly up around Chicago and uh, northern part of Indiana. It was being used and used and used. And people were getting off free because they were insane and they were miraculously cured within three months. Well, this could have stopped for a lot of that. And uh, we were, I think, the third or fourth state that had this particular law, and the ACLU really fought it. And uh, I had one member come up and say, I just don't agree with you. And I said, I'd be scared if you did. <laughs> As you have um, watched and continued your involvement with the crime victims movement or the field of crime victim services, is it maybe more often called now, through the years. 
uh, and with the perspective that you now have of about 30 years of work with it, where do you think we're going wrong now? Or what are we not doing as right as we did back in the beginning? Or how could we do things better right now? <laughs> um, one of the things that we did better was when we were all volunteers because no one was doing it as a job. When the funds came, came available, there were certain people who were not trained but declared to be victim service people, thinking they had all the answers when they really didn't have the training. And uh, they, they were more or less people that uh, worked in prosecutor's offices and notified that the court hearing was coming up as far as actually helping the victims. They didn't do much of it. And now I think that settled down, although there's still, I think, a great need for training and with certification coming up, I think it is wonderful because that's going to eliminate some of those people that are not qualified. Uh, but yet it's not going to eliminate those that have been in the field for a long time because if you care at all, you learn. Uh, there was a wonderful victim advocate in Indianapolis, Ruth Ann Popchick, and she always said, you can train them and train them for everything but to care. And if you don't, if you can't train them to care, you haven't gotten them right. And she, she had it right. People have to care or they can't do it, can't do a proper job. Um, if you were giving advice today to a brand new advocate in the field, um, I know from what you said already, you would tell him or her to get as much training as they possibly could. But what other practical things might they do to become this advocate who is both well-educated and has developed a real capacity to care? Well, be very patient with the law enforcement and with your victim that you're working with. Because the victim that you're working with wants things to happen overnight and then the of it just doesn't happen overnight. <clears throat> and learn to do all you can about the case and go ask the questions. You, you don't have all the answers. Possibly the prosecutor or someone else does. Find those, out the answers to the victim's questions. So they'll, they'll be more comfortable with the case. Uh, I know the first shock that I had <coughs> was two of them confessed and then turned right around and pleaded not guilty. And I, having had no experience with the system, I couldn't understand that at all. And I, I was really angry and upset with that. Well, there's many things like that that come up. And uh, a victim advocate needs to be knowledgeable on those things. And if you don't have the answer, don't play it by ear. Go find the answer. Because uh, that person will trust you as long as you don't don't try to play, play big shot. And a lot I found that there are some that, that try to pretend that they know everything. And it doesn't work that way. We all have questions. All the years that I worked with victims, there was always some, something new come up. And uh, get the training that you need 
go to every conference that you can possibly afford and have a good relationship with other victim advocates. As I learned a lot of over a cup of coffee at conferences. But we were all learning together and we're still learning. And I'm sure that 20 years from now we'll still be learning. That actually is a great segue to the very next question because you've been in this field now for almost 30 years. Uh, as you think ahead 30 years from now, about 2035, um, and I know you're just making this up, but if the field were then what you really wanted it to be, what would it look like? Um, number one, police officers would be well trained how to uh, interview a victim immediately. Because not everywhere are the victim advocates called out right away. Some places they are, some places they aren't. But the first thing anybody can say that will help a victim is, I'm sorry. That's a, that's a nice sound that somebody cares. And they are learning these things. They're being, police officers are being trained now to know how to handle the victim. Because when they're traumatized, they're not going to be good good the witnesses, and they're going to have a hard time getting through this. And society owes them just as much as they owe that, the person who committed the crime. And uh, a lot of people don't quite understand that. But uh, it's very important that the victim not be traumatized any more than necessary. And uh, I was fortunate being in a small community. I have a, an investigator that uh, we knew nothing about just an advocates at that time. But he and I got along real well from the start. And they had never handled a uh, case like ours, and certainly not one with a, a survivor. So it was determined that any questions that I had or anything that I brought up with the other officers would be turned over to Bonnie, and he would be the one that would talk to me about them. And it worked quite well. And uh, years later, he, he died not too many years ago. Years later, he said to me, what exactly is a victim uh, advocate? And I said, it's what you were on, and they didn't know what to call you. <laughs> But he was, um, he had that sixth sense of how, how to get me to help him, but then to how to help me. And uh, he knew when to be a little firm without being too firm, and uh, when to be sympathetic. He just had that. And you have to sense what the needs are. And the most important question a best victim advocate can ask a victim, in my word, my thoughts, is what can I do for you? Because sometimes we think they need something and they need something entirely different. And uh, it's not what they want or need at all. So I found that that was a very important question. the movement and the way it's going now? Not necessarily. Uh, of course, I've been, I haven't had, uh, I've had bad health for quite a while, so I haven't been able to be with the group like I used to be. But I still see it going. I still see people caring. And I still see some very poor victim advocates. But I think with uh, certification that they will uh, rid out those ones that are just not capable. They're doing it only for a salary. 
And this is a job that you just can't do just for a salary. It certainly deserve a salary, but that, there has to be more to it than that. And, uh, believe me, when there was funds available that came out of the woodwork. <laughs> Betty Jane, I know that at the time your boys were murdered, your faith was very important to you, and I know that your faith is very important to you now, and it has been uh, along your journey towards uh, recovery, even though recovery from something like this is never complete. I wonder if you could talk about your faith journey a little bit and the various uh, peaks and valleys of that over the years. Well, at first, I was depending on God so much, and then all of a sudden I became very angry with him. And I was angry with him for almost four years. Uh, I was angry with everybody and everything. It just, uh, I get up feeling angry and I go to bed feeling angry. And uh, it seemed like it was something I couldn't control. And I had lots of counseling and that helped. And a counselor asked me, who was I so angry with? And I said, I hate God. And it shocked me that I even said such a thing. <coughs> and he said, don't you think he understands that he loves you anyway? I'd like to say that that day everything straightened out, but that was the start of getting rid of my anger. And uh, so uh, more and more I began to depend on him, and he, he's just done nothing but taking care of me. With my health problems, uh, Everybody thinks this is going to be the end, and I'm still here. It's just he's, he's not ready for me to die, I guess. <clears throat> but he has helped me through a lot of things. And when I really stop and think about my life, I've had the worst that I can think of, and I've had the best. I've had a lot of wonderful opportunities to do things for people, and. And I feel that God's there. He's, he's still letting me help people. And uh, that helps me. And uh, he's going to be with me until it's time for me to go greet the boys. And of course, I have this wonderful imagination. They're going to be standing at the gate with their hands in their pockets, of course. <laughs> I don't believe I ever saw that in the Bible. But <laughs> But it, it seems like that'd be a good place for him. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, there's a, a passage in the Bible that helped me a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get it. This is, uh, uh, J.B. Phillips' version of the New Testament, of modern English, New Testament, in the modern English. This was uh, Greg's New Testament. And uh, when I picked it up several, a long time after he had died, I found that he had many passages marked. And the thing that helped me the most was in Thessalonians. And it says, be happy in your faith at all times. Never stop praying. Be thankful, whatever the circumstances may be. And that, that helped me a lot. And beside there, it says, thank you, God. But there's little places through here. It's just, he's marked and it'll say, wow, or, you know, it's, very, it's been very special.
several years ago now, Betty Jane, you were um, in our home struggling with the issue of uh, forgiveness when one of the offenders had um, approached you uh, about that, and you were trying your best to deal with that with honesty and integrity. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about that struggle back during that time and what you came up with? I just read this. Oh, okay. All right, that's fine. 